this session um, about wiretapping, um, digital wiretapping, and I will specifically speak about the situation here in the Netherlands. So it's about surveillance in the lowlands. Uh, for all you people that are coming from abroad, you probably look uh, upon the Netherlands as a quite liberal country. Uh, you can smoke dope here, you can go to paper conferences. Uh, well, the situation is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, on the uh, with, with involved interception of telecommunications, the situation in Holland is quite more, ser more serious than in most other European countries. We are much further in legislation, we are much further, I think, in the actual capabilities that law enforcement have to do digital interception. So let me tell you how uh, digital wiretaps uh, in the Netherlands are organized. Um, they started with making a new telecommunications law here a few years ago, and uh, there's one chapter about lawful access. And the most important thing is that all telecommunication companies, um, telephone companies, ISPs, anything in between or similar like that, uh, need to make their network fit for interception. That means they need to implement an architecture that makes it possible for law enforcement um, to intercept traffic. So this is about having an interface to deliver wiretap material to a law enforcement facility. Second point is um, the companies, telecommunication companies, have to pay themselves for this architecture. So they they have to pay. Um, which, especially for smaller companies, can be small ISPs, local ISPs, it can be quite a, a big burden. For the actual wiretaps itself, the ISP can um, uh, charge administrative and personal costs. But that's a different story than the, the equipment, the architecture, and the industry. Uh, we are now uh, past the date. Uh, there was a date, the uh, uh, 1st of April, uh, when all telecommunications companies in the Netherlands had to have this ready. They had to have their interface installed. Um, this means uh, uh, equipment to actually intercept the traffic of the customer. And secondly, the interface to be able to <coughs> transport the intercepted traffic to the law enforcement facility. Yesterday, Paul Wouters uh, did a presentation uh, on, the, on the protocol called Transfer of um, Intercepted Internet Traffic, TIIT, which is basically the protocol that is used to do this transfer of intercepted material, which is a uh, encrypted uh, deliverance of the material to one person. Um, for law enforcement to be able to have a digital wiretap, uh, that is regulated by criminal code in Holland, and it requires a court order. Um, the word court order is subject to erosion in this country. Um, originally, a court order should be something like a judge reviewing the case, uh, making a judgment if it's necessary that in this investigation, wiretaps are being used, and then uh, deciding on how many wiretaps for which period. Um, in the meantime, the amount of wiretaps that are given out by courts in Holland, um, that figure is so high, and I'll tell you the figure later on, that it's not possible to do that kind of detailed review. Uh, I mean, it's just <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of wiretaps going to these courts. Every week. Um, so this is a rubber stamp procedure. Um, more serious is even that uh, prosecutors can order wiretaps themselves, which are basically afterwards reviewed by a judge. So 
the court order is something that sounds very beautiful, uh, in, but in reality it's, it's uh, something you should not take uh, very high. Uh, um, technically, the system works uh, different than what you know about the Honeywell story. Uh, here there is a clear uh, division between interception and analysis of the tracking. Uh, the ISP needs to do the interception. Uh, he needs to do it with his own equipment, with his own personnel, and he needs to figure out himself how to do it. Um, he is getting rules about uh, what the intercept should uh, be made of, so which is the, the minimal, minimal requirements uh, for the intercept, which is always full content. There's no division between headers and content. <coughs> it's everything, it's just a raw, full content, full piece of the IP copy. Um, ISP is intercepting um, at their own facility. The law enforcement is getting the full uh, stream uh, real time of the subject they are investigating and law enforcement is doing their own analysis. Um, regarding um, ISPs, we have more or less three situations in Holland where law enforcement will ask for data. The first, the most common use is law enforcement asking for subscriber information. Basically, law enforcement asking the ISP to go through its customer records and find out stuff like a username, uh, please match it with a name and address so we can uh, start an investigation for that person. Um, probably other way around will also uh, be used like this is the real name of a person, please tell us which username that person has. Third, the second situation is uh, law enforcement looking for traffic data, looking for log files. Um, they might have a, a, a username, they might have an IP number, and they might have a time and date, and they will then ask information about what happened with that IP number, that time and date. Um, in many, many cases, it will be just plain radius of the Information. The third uh, uh, possibility is law enforcement uh, uh, having a warrant for a full wiretap. Just plain wiretap. Just giving me everything going to the customer and coming from the customer. No filtering, nothing, just give me everything going to that person. Um, Traffic data is, is quite complicated uh, subject at the moment, especially regarding what is happening now in the, uh, with the Cybercrime Treaty and in Europe uh, with m call plans uh, on uh, uh, data retention and data preservation. Um, basically, the situation in the Netherlands at this moment is that ISPs are not required to do any data preservation. So, if law enforcement will ask them for traffic data, they can say, sorry, we don't have that. It's possible. Um, of course, the reality is that ISP block. They don't block because law enforcement tells them to do it. They block for all kinds of internal reasons to be able to have an abuse policy or to be able to uh, do uh, uh, all kinds of system administrative stuff. <coughs> So they're logging anyway. In many cases, it's it, it's possible for law enforcement to get radius records or to get information from radius records. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one exception outside uh, ISPs uh, uh, that we have. Uh, uh, GSM operators are required to log location data for prepaid GSMs, but only for the prepaid ones. The story behind that is that when prepaid GSMs were into, uh, introduced in Holland, there was a discussion about um, having people to identify when they buy a prepaid card, so you know who is behind uh, a certain telephone number. Um, GSM operators very successfully resisted against that uh, idea, uh, so there's no registration. Uh, 
Um, but there is a, a, a device called the MC Catcher. It's a device made by Roy and Schwartz, a big company in Germany. Um, it's a device that is a, a mobile device which is able to uh, basically pretend it's a GSM base station. And it can like catch the hardware number of a mobile phone. So if police is chasing, doing covert surveillance on the person that has a prepaid GSM, they will be able, if they walk quite, quite, quite close to the person, they will be able to retrieve the hardware number of the phone and then with the hardware number of the phone they go to the GSM operator and they request a wiretap on that number and then it doesn't matter anymore if the subject is changing prepaid cards because the phone is keeping the same hardware number. It's a long story to explain why there is this exception for prepaid GSM. Uh, of course, the, the plans that are now circulating in Enforpol uh, in, in Europe will, will worsen the situation because the, the, the requirements in Holland for traffic data are quite, quite limited at the moment and uh, the ideas in, in, in Europe are going between preservation of data traffic from three months to one year and some English uh, law enforcement people are even talking about seven years. Um, because there has been so much uh, talk about carnivore, it may be good to shortly explain the difference between a system like carnivore and the system that is used here in the Netherlands. With carnivore, it's law enforcement that intercepts. So law enforcement has a box puts its seal at the ISP, filters and intercepts the traffic in doing the analysis. So they do basically everything, um, which is quite different than in other ones. Also, the whole debate, the legal debate in the States about carnivore is about the fact that that box is used in different situations. It's used when the warrant is limited to a pen registry type warrant, where you are only allowed to uh, intercept traffic data. But the same box with the same capability is also used for situations where there is a full content wiretap. So the whole discussion is about how do you know that a sealed box that is intercepting traffic data is not intercepting the full content. Um, to be, if you look at the, the statistics on um, digital wiretapping, and then it's good to go into the history a little bit and to see what happened with uh, normal telephone in the past. Uh, there are not many statistics. Uh, there is a lot of secrecy about statistics. And in a few minutes you will really understand why. There is a 1996 report uh, from the Ministry of Justice and that is about the situation in 93 and 94. And there were 3,000 telephone intercepts. And when I talk about intercepts, I talk about full content, nothing else. For content. Um, and the number of telephone caps is uh, based on the number on telephone numbers. So it's not the number of warrants or anything like that, just actual numbers. 3,000, uh, which are all have an average length of four weeks. And the Ministry of Justice themselves concluded that there are more intercepts than in any other European country. And I'm talking about 93, 94. So Germany, England, France, they couldn't find figures which are higher. There is a lot of suspicion about England if the figures in England are actually correct. Then if you look uh, at the start of, uh, of the GSM explosion, when GSM became, uh, became big in the Netherlands, that's around 98. You see that in 98, the, the amount of intercepts uh, uh, raised to uh, 10,000. Uh, and 3,000 of that was a, a, a plain old telephone system. And 7,000 of that was GSM. So the introduction of GSM, uh, Uh, resulted in an enormous growth of the number of intercepts. Let me tell you something about the interception infrastructure. 
Um, traditionally, Dutch police has regions, and every region has its main office. And every main office had its own interception facility, where the tape recorders were uh, based to record telephone conversations. With all the new technology coming, they are, uh, they are uh, concentrating the whole thing in three national interception facilities, which are more up to date with the latest technology. They opened one uh, March last year. It's a facility that can do 10,000 simultaneously intercepts, internet, telephone, GSM, everything, 1,000 simultaneously. And very proudly, in their own magazine, they called it the biggest law enforcement interception center in Europe, which made us very proud. Um, they're building two more of these. Uh, and these, two, these three intercepts will then, uh, interception centers will then be uh, organized within a, 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 an organization called the LEO, the National Interception Organization, and that is going to be in Holland the main responsible organization for organizing law enforcement interception. For uh, subscriber data, uh, access to subscriber data, we have a completely separate system, which is at the moment only functioning for GSM and telephone operators. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised that in the near future, ISPs are added to that system. It's called the CIOT, and um, it's, a, it's a system where um, um, this government agency has real-time access to the subscriber databases of telephone companies. Um, no, we don't want it. At the moment, they still need one. Uh, but it's completely electronic, so the warrant is a digital sign electronic. Uh, um, it's built in such a way uh, by using cryptography that the telephone company can't see when and how its database is being accessed. Uh, they can't see which agency is, uh, is accessing it. So. This, this, this uh, uh, government department is actually working as an anonymizer for, for different uh, agencies. Um, because not only law enforcement is using it, also the national uh, security services are using it. So uh, the companies are never able to see who is accessing the database. Okay. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. If that's the case, then how, if I'm prosecuted and brought to court, how do I challenge whether the warrant was valid or not? <coughs> Yeah. Well, there is there is uh, <coughs> the first thing there is not so much to um, defend against because this is subscriber data. This but is, is, it, is it it yeah. yeah. Well, this is this is only about matching the telephone number or username to a real name. Of course. There is a warrant that should be part of the dossier that the prosecutor is presenting to the court. But uh, the telephone company has no role in this process. Completely outside. It has a plausible enough. Uh, digital wiretap forecast. Some time ago, figures leaked out that the national organization of Dutch ISPs made internally. It's their idea of what will happen in the coming three years. Um, and they are they made up this forecast. The percentage is the percentage of the total amount of users. Usernames, accounts, telephone numbers, whatever. Uh, no, no, sorry, not telephone numbers. This is only about digital items. Uh, in the first year, uh, they expect one half thousand, and then next year four half thousand, and third year nine thousand. So add that up to the ten thousand I mentioned before for telephone systems in GSM, which will also grow. Um, it means in the third year you are very close at twenty-five thousand, thirty thousand incidents in one year. So that's growth. Uh, 
Um, the number of requests for subscriber information, they expect uh, 15,000 requests for the first year, and that going to 300,000 requests in the third year. And look at the percentage in the third year, it's 5%. That means subscribers. So they expect... Exactly. They, they expect, uh, Dutch providers expect that in the third year of this system working, police will uh, request subscriber information of every one out of 20 internet users. Um, of course, if you talk about, if you talk about interception, you very soon also start talking about cryptography. And the control of cryptography is uh, one of the most important tools for governments to maintain their interception uh, capabilities. Uh, let me give you a short review of what happened to cryptography in Holland in the last uh, eight years. Uh, there was, uh, once upon a time, uh, a proposal to restrict end users to restrict the use of end users by introducing a license scheme. Uh, and the license scheme would be made in such a way that only companies that could explain why they needed to encrypt their information were able to get a license. So it's a very complicated way to forbid the property. Um, the plan didn't make it. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of resistance to it. And it was dropped. Then there was a, a proposal to have self-incrimination, so to have a law that would force uh, a suspect to deliver either text or keys when required. Um, this plan is also dropped because of a lot of resistance, because it's, of course, a clear violation of uh, the right of every suspect not to uh, incriminate himself. Um, so government is still looking for a new uh, strategy, um, how to deal with cryptography. The latest development is uh, concentrating on trusted third parties. Um, there is a big national program to stimulate and regulate uh, the, the, the trusted third parties. Um, and the idea that government is uh, uh, slowly trying to influence that, that those TDPs with is the idea is that if a TDP is doing any kind of uh, confidentiality service, so any kind of service where material is encrypted, it should only be allowed to do so when it also stores keys. So the idea is not to uh, force key escrow on everybody. You don't have to deliver your key. But if you use a TDP for your encryption services, then the TDP is required to store your key or be able to recover your key. The idea behind it is, of course, that uh, TDPs, if they are really going into confidentiality services, uh, they will generate an enormous growth of the use of cryptography. Uh, so if you, you can deal with that growth from a government perspective, if you implement the escrow, uh, the small amount of users that is not using the TTP, you will deal with them in a traditional way. That, that may be what, what's happening now, uh, like working keyboards. Uh, it's also a very efficient way that the FBI is using it. Um, it's very unclear if this plan for TTPs is going to work because TDPs work on the basis of trust, and uh, if people think they can't trust the TDP, they will not be interested in the service. And also, TDPs can decide to go to a country where they don't are required; they are not required to do the So the the, the 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 netto effect of this whole plan could just be that the, the deployment of TDPs in Holland will have an enormous delay uh, compared to surrounding countries. Uh, also, when you talk about interception, 
you can look at interception as a, as a, a security risk. Uh, having a structure for interception means you make a hole in your system uh, which law enforcement can get in. Uh, of course, you have to look very carefully if other people cannot also get in. Um, the intercepted traffic in, uh, uh, in Holland from the ISP is, as, as uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Carl Wouters told uh, yesterday, is going to, through one single machine. Because the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, which is a appearing point in, in, in Holland, uh, has one government machine, one government router, and all ISPs that have to deliver their real-time intercepted traffic are delivering it to the IP number of that router. So all the traffic, law enforcement or national security services, is going through that one router. And uh, Paul even wrote an article which uh, has the MAC address of that machine. So. <laughs> um, I would just like to, to point to uh, a very good uh, RFC, uh, 2804. So, uh, that is a result of the Raven discussion inside the Internet the Engineering Task Force. Uh, started, I think it's two years ago. Uh, FBI came up to the, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force and told them, hey, if you make new IP protocols, please consider building in uh, interception capabilities. Uh, that resulted in a, in a discussion inside the, the task force uh, called the Raven discussion, which was basically a name list. Um, and it resulted in an RFC that explained why building in that kind of capabilities is a very big mistake, very wrong idea. Um, the whole proposal in Holland uh, regarding key escrow, if you read the government report about the possibilities to implement key escrow in the parties, you will notice that at no point there is any interest in that report to the security risks of having key escrow. Having the single point of failure that the TDP with thousands and tens of thousands of keys is, is, is having on your infrastructure. And in general, um, you see in the Netherlands, but I think that is not very different from the countries in Europe, uh, that dealing with security, uh, with telecommunication security, dealing with information security, is completely focusing on criminal code. The whole idea that you can contain all those risks by making laws and training uh, law enforcement. And of course you can't. Um, of course, there is public concern uh, in the Netherlands about these uh, developments, um, but it's limited for the very simple reason that most parties in Parliament think that fighting crime is a very important thing, and the rest are an interesting resource. The concerns and the critique on this is uh, concentrating on a few points. First of all, the total lack of transparency regarding interception. There are no statistics. I mean, the figures I showed you are partly unofficial figures, figures that leak, for example. Um, you will not find a yearly report by the Ministry of Justice uh, telling you how much wiretaps they did in the, in the previous year. Very different from, for example, the uh, United States, where every year an extremely detailed report is made by the uh, uh, Ministry of Justice. Um, also, the, the whole legislation which is dealing with this uh, uh, interception is a framework. If you read it, there is nothing inside. It just tells you we will intercept, and the details are something that law enforcement and ISPs have to deal with. So, Parliament has never been confronted with the gory details of digital uh, wiretaps. They just um, uh, they just let law enforcement to take the decision on any details. The result is negotiations between government and ISPs. Um, 
And those negotiations are, of course, uh, are not in public. They are in closed rooms. Uh, there is sometimes uh, some information coming out, sometimes not. Uh, in the meantime, uh, most people uh, will find it very, very difficult to know uh, in which direction uh, the interception policies are actually going. There is no accountability on all this stuff, uh, apart from the statistics, but there is also no annual reports on policy. There is no oversight body. There is not a, a, a like a government commission reviewing how intercepts went, uh, like taking out hundred examples and reviewing them very carefully. Um, everything is left to the judges that have to sign their court orders. And if you talk about ten thousand intercepts a year, you can only conclude that those judges are very cooperative and are probably in a rubber stamp mode. So in general, I would say that the, the traditional safeguards that uh, people are talking about, the safeguards that are keeping us apart from a, a real uh, total surveillance society, those safeguards are eroding. The, the traditional idea that a judge will review law enforcement activities and will protect us from excessive intrusions is, is not valid anymore. Uh, these judges are just stamping things. Well, I hope uh, we have a lot of questions because we have, uh, well, <coughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe for comments, questions, whatever. Um, do we have like a wireless microphone? Or people just chat? Uh, now, uh, I
that um, in most cases the intercept interceptions don't lead to evidence. Uh, the role of interceptions is not so much having evidence in court, but much more uh, technical support for investigations. So it's about finding out with whom the, con the, the subject is in contact with, finding out when he's leaving the city, when he's coming back, that kind of support.
Sure. But that's a general rule. But there's a specific rule that the ISP has to keep uh, secrecy about uh, intercepts. And there's even a whole, whole procedure how to organize that secrecy. But I mean, that is, that is not a new story. That is, that is going on for years with telephone companies. There's nothing new about it. When you talk about securing digital evidence, does that have any regulations on that? Yeah, but there is a story called told yesterday about the protocol. There is a, uh, there is a whole forensic uh, story around the, the interface and the, and the deliverance of the, of the data. Uh, it's really signed and all that kind of stuff. We have to, we only have one minute left, so last question. <laughs> I mean, uh, the question is if you if you would use cryptography, would that make you more of a suspect? Um, probably, in a lot of cases, probably. I think that in a lot of investigations, if, if, if one of the suspects is uh, encrypting all this stuff, um, it would lead to um, the suspicion that that is something very interesting. Probably. I'm sorry, time is over, so thank you very much.